Peg Newhauser. Cultural Connections. Building on Corporate Change. To save time, fast forward to the section of your choice. About Peg Newhauser. Peg Newhauser has been in the business of management and organizational change for more than 18 years. As a consultant with degrees in both psychology and sociology, combined with her practical experience working in the corporate world, she brings a fresh perspective. Targeting areas like conflict resolution, mediation, and dealing with difficult people, Peg uses culture as a means of implementing corporate change. Highly respected in her field, Peg has been featured in and written for journals, magazines, and newspapers all over the world. Culture.com, Building Corporate Culture in the Connected Workplace, was co-authored by Peg Newhauser. She's also written Corporate Legends and Lore, as well as Tribal Warfare in Organizations, Turning Tribal Conflict into Negotiated Peace. Tribal Warfare in Organizations. In addition to being the title of Peg's first book, Tribal Warfare is Real. Sooner or later, it happens in every organization, and Peg Newhauser knows how to deal with it. What I have discovered over the years, uh, from my background in sociology and then working in organizations once I got out in the world, is that we're just as tribal as we ever were in terms of our behavior. And that's what I'm going to talk about this uh, lunchtime with you and give you some tips and some thoughts and ideas about how to deal with that. I would certainly say, as Rich was saying, it's not the kind of thing you want to give up on and just assume it's always going to be that way. Um, although the bad news, I guess, maybe is it is always going to be that way because that's human nature. It's been with us forever, and so it's always something that you have to face and deal with. I think the solution, however, is not necessarily to ignore it, because it can get worse, frankly, if you do that, but, also, but just basically to kind of um, whittle away at it is often how I think of it, is you're always trying to push as far as you can of creating some linkages and bridges between people, knowing that the reality is of how people are and groups are, there's always going to be a struggle, there's always going to be differences of opinion. And frankly, that's probably not a bad thing because some of the best ideas you'll get in any organization are if you can stand it in terms of dealing with the differences in the, and the frictions that occur and figure out how to get the both, best of both or all the different groups you deal with. I often think of it as you want the best out of the collective IQ of the group you're working with. So my last tip and piece of advice to you as I close today will be around about humor. As I'm sure all of you have discovered many times in your career, sometimes if you can make people laugh, that'll just cut the tension like nothing else will. And there's a terrific story, it's a true story, it's part of why I like it, that a man named Nirenberg tells. He does negotiations work and has written a lot of books about it. And the story is about, a, he was in a conference room with a client sitting on one side of the conference table and they were in a negotiation. The man was there from the other company sitting on the other side of the table and they reached a deadlock. And it was a very angry deadlock. So the man from the other company was furious. Leaped out of his chair, grabbed his briefcase, turned on his heels, stormed out of the door and slammed the door behind him. Boom. Very dramatic exit from the room. The people sitting at the table just stared at the door and were stunned because they knew the man had just walked into the closet <laughs> of the conference room. This is a true story. Now, I, this could happen to any of us in this room. Can you imagine? I'd die. I would die. Well, they just sat there at the table, stunned. Nobody said a word. You know, they were all just paralyzed, staring at the door because there was no sound, no movement, nothing. About a minute went past. Finally, the door flung open. The guy leaped out, still carrying his briefcase, and yelled, ta-da! <laughs> They all laughed. I mean, what else would you do? He came back over and sat down, and they reached an agreement in 10 minutes. True story. Culture.com. 
It's a clicks and mortar world. Traditional companies are constantly struggling to play catch up. Success comes to those that are willing to bridge the gap between the old and new ways of doing business. The CEO of the company, Charles Morgan, told me this story, and it has a name. It's the 100 Days Story at Axiom. And it had just finished at the time I interviewed him. And he said what happened was they were working on a product development that had taken forever. It bogged down. It was really important to the future of the company. So one day when he was meeting with some of the key engineers, just off the top of his head, he said to him, how about if we just set a goal, say we'll finish it in 90 days, and just do whatever we have to do to pull that off. And they all kind of looked at him like he was nuts. They started talking about it. And somebody had a calendar and noticed that from t today's date, uh, September 1, I believe, was 100 days out. And they finally said, well, how about 100 days? Give us 100 days and we'll do it. And Charles said, a deal. And then he joined the teams, they organized a bunch of teams, and they went for it. And we talk in the book about all the lessons learned from the 100 Days Project, but it was a roaring success. They accomplished it with their goal within 100 days, and the interesting thing, they accomplished far more than their goal way more than the standards they set for themselves. In some of their processes, they, they took something like 98% of the steps out of processes that were involved from an engineering point of view. It was amazing, the descriptions of it. But he said the thing that was so important about culture is it caught on throughout the entire company. This is about 2,500 people in this company. And he said all over the company, with no one asking them to, people started setting 100-day time frames for projects that ordinarily would have taken a lot longer than that, in HR, in marketing, in all different areas of the company, not just the engineers. And it became a new norm, a new way of doing things in the company. So it had an impact on the speed and the pacing with which they did everything. One of the most important traits that you have as an individual to survive and thrive in this clicks and mortar world is curiosity just plain and simple curiosity. The people who are doing well at this point in time aren't the people who know everything and are the ultimate techies, because we have a lot of technology people in the audience today, and every one of them can tell you how quickly even they can become outdated and have to keep updating what they know and how things work and what the skills are. So there's no way to learn it all and know it all and have arrived on this topic. So the constant willingness to not know the answer and keep asking and looking and experimenting and playing around with things. If you think of the theme through all the things I say to you in the next 45 minutes or so, you're going to hear a constant drumbeat of that need for being curious. And I would suggest to you, if you have a relatively high level of curiosity about all this, you'll do just fine. Changing and merging cultures. Core values count when merging cultures. PEG provides practical tips on how to recognize those values and use them to your company's advantage. Sometimes people will refer to the culture of an organization as the personality of the organization. So if you're going to put two companies together to work together and they have two very different personalities, cultures, it would be just like two individuals having to do that. There's some things to work out if you're going to try to make that work. Uh, one of my clients uses a, a definition that I like a lot because he's kind of getting at the core of what culture is. He says culture is what you do when nobody's watching. <laughs> Isn't that a good one? And I think that what he's really talking about is those, that top one there, the heart and soul, the core of the culture that everything else comes from in that. But it's a very good definition. Make sure you do some really good due diligence on the cultures of the different organizations you're planning to bring together, not just the finances and the business strategies and the market share issues and some of those kinds of things that tend historically to be what people focus on when they're deciding who to put together in a mix for a, let, let's just focus on a merger in this case. The problem with doing that, leaving out the cultural due diligence, how similar are we, how different are we in terms of cultures, is that the primary reason from research that groups like McKinsey and various groups have done for years, if you look at the reasons that mergers or acquisitions fall apart, or even if they don't completely fall apart, don't ever produce the return 
that they were intended to produce, the vast majority of the reasons, many times 60, 70 percent of them, they'll say, are, are culture misfits. They never got it to jive. People were never willing to work together or able to work together in the way that they were supposed to. So if you ignore on the front end, which is what often happens, the culture issues and choose your potential partner based on all the other reasons, you're at great risk of joining what ends up being the 50 or 60 percent of mergers that don't ever produce the results they were supposed to. Strengthening relationships. Organizations run on relationships. Peg Neuhauser not only defines the politics of relationships, but explains how to cultivate behaviors professionally and personally. One of the funniest stories that a, a, a colleague of mine who's a marriage counselor tells us about a couple who was in her office and she gave them this survey to see the difference on these. And, and the woman was an artist and very much into the obviously the pictures, the imagery and sort of the I've got an idea way of thinking or, or looking at things. And she was married to an engineer who was very much into the detailed factuals, you know, make lists kind of thinking. Of course, that's as far apart as you can get on the panel. <laughs> they got their results, and the woman was looking at them, got very serious, and was listening to the explanation and everything. She looked up at her husband with a serious look on her face and said, now I understand why you alphabetize the cereal boxes in the pantry. <laughs> <laughs> you see the potential trouble here? She, he would get mad at her every morning because she wouldn't put the raisin bran back in the R slot. <laughs> now my thinking pattern is like her, and let me tell you, if the raisin bran's back in the kitchen, you're doing well. Corporate legends and lore. Much of everyday business is communicated through stories. Peg defines the role of storytelling and its capacity to strengthen the culture and spirit of the workplace. If you think about a new employee being hired in your organization, first day on the job, they've been through the interviewing process since their first day. Let's say in your organization you send them off first to an orientation for the whole day and it's a good one. Let's assume it's, you know, it's interesting, it's inspiring, they get real excited about the company, etc., etc. Uh, and because uh, a lot of companies are really working on their orientations and they are good these days. All right, so the end of the day, they're, they're finished with the orientation. They go back to the department where they will be working. And as I always say, a couple of the tribal elders descend, all right? Take them off to a corner and say, okay, now we're going to tell you how we really dot, dot, dot. You know, who are the friends, who are the enemies, what are the stories around the place. Which set, if those two sets of information at the orientation, the formal orientation, and uh, there are those stories in the department didn't match, if they were contradictory in some way, which set of information do you think that employee would be likely to believe? The stories, right? And everybody knows that. Of course they would. In fact, they almost have to in terms of their enculturation or being accepted into the group. If they argued with those tribal elders, they'd be in all sorts of trouble before they even started their job. So there is a tremendous power around storytelling. Now, it's a neutral tool. And that's one thing that, uh, that I want to emphasize and talk about today is it is just a communication tool. So it can be used for good or for bad in any setting. Abraham Lincoln was one of the world's greatest storytellers and many of the stories I quote in the book are stories from him that he used to make a point with people. So was Adolf Hitler, one of the greatest storytellers. So there is no indication whatsoever about which direction the use of that communication tool will go. All we know is it's very powerful and you better be careful with it and really think about where you want to go with that and what you want to do in terms of storytelling.